we are currently in the middle of meditating on the sorrowful mysteries. Why shouldn't we be doing the joyful mysteries? That's what Advent's all about. Well, if we, we kind of got into, you know, we're going through the, the mysteries, uh, and we happen to be here at this time. But it reminded me that this is the reason why Jesus came. He came to suffer and die for our sins, to show us the extent of God's love for us. No greater love has any man to show than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus is the prime example of that. He willingly took on all of the sufferings that the Father was pleased to send him in order for you and I to be redeemed. And this is what Advent is really about. And this is something, again, to kind of whet your appetite for our merry deconstructed Christmas. Yeah. Uh, the church really didn't, well, it not really didn't, the church didn't start celebrating the birth of Christ until well into the fourth century. Um, but in the earliest days of the church, the biggest controversy wasn't when he was born, but when he rose again. That was the biggest controversy of the church. The biggest controversy of the, of the early church, which took a whole council to finally define, was when should we celebrate Easter? When? Not if, but when? And to this day, there is a split between the Eastern Rite churches and the Western Rite churches over when should we celebrate Easter. But this controversy goes all the way back well early into the second and third centuries people were the, the church was wondering when we should celebrate easter so it wasn't they weren't concerned about when jesus was born more than they were concerned about when he died and rose again that was of a greater concern so just a little, little tidbit about our merry deconstructed christmas uh, on, on how that goes I love the meditating on the sorrowful mysteries by using images of the shroud, by the way. And when we talk about the crown of thorns, um, it's this area right here in the scalp area. And if you notice, these are blood stains, by the way. All of these. All of this in here, in the hair, all of that is blood. There are blood stains. All in the image of the shroud. What's interesting about it, if you were to look at the back side of the, the head, it's speckled with these kind of puncture marks all in the back of the head as well as the front, which suggests by shroud scholars, yes, there are scholars that study the shroud, that our traditional idea of this <coughs> ringlet you know, that the soldiers wove this kind of ringlet and put it on his head, like we see in our crucifixes, is really incorrect. What most likely happened is that they took a thorn bush and just jammed it onto his head and perhaps even tied it down as kind of a mockery. And the reason they say that is because the shroud shows all of these puncture wounds all over the head which suggests that there was something that was poking all over, not just around here like a band or a headband, uh, suggesting that that was what the crown of thorns was actually like. And when I read in the gospel where they put a reed in his hand and mocked him as king of the Jews, and they took the reed and hit him on the head, he was probably still wearing this, and that's what, you know, you imagine driving those thorns into the scalp. Of, of our Lord. And all the lacerations in the head caused a lot of bleeding. So it was just all in the hair of Jesus. It was just matted with, with the blood that was from this uh, torture that the, that the soldiers uh, did to him. Uh, and so that's that meditation on that. A little deeper uh, insight uh, into the crown of thorns. And it's also interesting to note that, uh, I always like to point this out when I talk about the shroud, that if this were a forgery, most likely the forger would have depicted Jesus with a crown of thorns, similar to the ones that we see in our statues today even, as this little ringlet 
Why come up with this kind of elaborate thing of puncture wounds all around the head and, in, and blood in the hair when you would just probably have seen a little ringlet around the forehead, uh, which again suggests that this wasn't made out of copying our traditional images or statues or pictures of Jesus, but that this suggests something more of a real event that occurred outside of our traditional understanding. Do I, do I make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if this were a forgery, you would copy it like you see statues in the church so that people would say, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's, the, it, it's our Lord because it looks like the statues in the church. But because it doesn't, it makes you go, what, what caused you to do that? It's like the wrist wounds. You know, there are wounds on the shroud that go through the wrist right here. Not here, like you see even in our crucifixes. Jesus had nails in here. You know, you see that in all the pictures and stuff and our crucifixes. But on the shroud, they're not through the palms. They're through the wrists because that's where crucifixion would, would normally happen. So again, if this is a forger, why do it that way when people wouldn't have thought of that? They put it in here where everyone, everyone knows this is where Jesus was crucified in his palm. You see what I'm saying? So it suggests that there is something more here than a forger would have thought of. Okay? If this is a forgery like people are claiming, oh, it's a forgery, you know, forget about it. Well, the forger went through a lot of trouble to come up with an image of Jesus that looks nothing like our modern crucifixes. Nothing like it. And a lot more like what we know Roman crucifixion would have been like. So whoever did this had a good knowledge of, of first century Roman crucifixion styles. So again, why would a forger go through all that trouble to fake people? Because remember, it's a forgery to just fake people into, you know, giving money for, for phony relics, you know. And it's like, really? You're going through all of this trouble and, and, and making the fake so different than what you're normally used to. It doesn't add up. Something's not adding up here. Something's wrong, you know, in this. So just a little food for thought. Yes. What's the shroud? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. What's the shroud? It's called the Shroud of Turin. It is a cloth approximately 14 feet long and six feet uh, and about three feet wide, I believe, three or four feet wide. And it has, a, these are negative images. If you take a picture of it and you took old fashioned cameras and you took the negatives and you just developed the negatives, this is what it would look like. And it has, it is a cloth, it's just cloth, it's like a tablecloth um, that has this picture on it. And it appears to be a picture of a crucified man. Yes, it's in Turin, Italy. It's in a it's in a cathedral um, that is um, displayed every now and then for people to look at. Uh, let me see if I can get a picture of what the real shroud would look like. Um, this is a picture of what the shroud would look like if you were to go and see it as it is. Let's see if I can blow it up. I just assume that people know what this is. I'm glad that you said something. Uh, okay. Shift up. Just do that. Oh, I don't. Uh, plus, 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 plus. Okay. Oh, here it is on display. 
in the church. You can really barely see it in this picture, notice that? Okay. You have to get real close to see what it looks like. See, here's the wounds in the wrist. You see, they're in the wrist, not in the palms. Uh, that big blob there is blood. It's human blood. The shroud has been analyzed and analyzed by scientists at least seriously since 1978. Uh, it's gone through a series of tests, like what is the cloth made of? What is the burn stains made of? Is there any paint, pigment, powder, or dye on the shroud? Um, you know, they've been analyzing this to find out why is there a picture on it and how was it made? And the only thing that we, we know for sure is this. There is no paint, pigment, powder, or dye on the shroud. None. What is on the shroud are water stains and blood. The, the four dark things, are those blood or water stains? These? Yes. These are burn marks that are what's left over. The shroud experienced um, a fire in 1572 in the cathedral that it was in. And uh, the reliquary that it was put in was made of silver. The church became so hot because of the fire, the silver melted and dripped onto the folded shroud. As a result, these scorch marks were created. These were patches that the nuns sewed onto the burn marks back in the 1570s. The white. The white patches, yes. Yeah. This down here is a water stain because when the cathedral was burning, one of the sisters ran in with some water to save the shroud. And when she did, she threw it onto the reliquary to stop it from melting onto the shroud. It's a really a, a miracle that the shroud survived the fire because you think molten lead, molten silver on this very <coughs> old cloth, it should have went poof up into smoke. And the fact that it didn't, but the, the reliquary around it melted, that says something as to the miraculous nature of the shroud. But forget that. One of the things that it did was provide us with a test. What do you mean a test? Well, you notice these dark spots are burn marks because it's from the fire in 1572. Well, when you analyze what, how the shroud is, what, what, what caused it? If there's no paint on it, then how is it on there? The best that our scientists can conclude is somehow it is burned onto the shroud. The, the image resembles a burn. Like when you take your iron and you scorch your blouse, and the image of the iron is on there, well, that's what happened. Because this image is the same as this as far as what it does to the shroud material. The process is the same. Okay. So it wasn't painted on, it was somehow burned onto the shroud. Yes? No, actually it has had very little exposure uh, over the course of time. And the reason we know that is that there's very little that's on it, on the shroud itself. However, one of the tests that was done on the shroud uh, was used to determine what kind of pollen was on it. How often was it exposed to the air and where it was exposed. And so there were various parts like all up and down the shroud that they took scotch tape and they just placed it on there and peeled it off. And on it were micro pollen grains from the areas where it, it had been exposed to. And of the various places that the shroud must have been exposed to was France, Italy, Turkey, and Palestine. So the pollen that's on the shroud means that it had to have been exposed to the open air from Palestine to France. 
because of the pollen grains are from flowers and plants native only to those regions. So what it does is it shows us a history of where it came from. From Palestine, through Turkey, into Europe, and finally into Turin, where it is right now. You say it's about three feet wide? It's about four feet wide, four I believe. Feet wide. <coughs> so if that's the front image, so then he would have been wrapped? Uh, no, it's more like folded on top of him. Okay. So let me get another image here. So where was he when he was covered with the shroud? So here's, here's an idea of what it, was, what it looks like. And I, oh, I can probably get a real big image. Yeah. So this is the length of the cloth. It's about it's 14 feet wide, I believe. It's about four feet wide. And this is the front image. And Where then is this the is image, the back. Though? Point out this. The there's oh, the there's, space. There's the yeah. face. All right. Okay. There's his face. There's the arms. Here's his chest. Here's his legs. And then on the back side, here's the back of the head. His back, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. his rear, his calves, yeah. his feet. Yeah. But you see that it's very faint in yeah. this kind yeah. of image. Yeah. Right. But now, if you, usually when they bury somebody, I would think the arms would be like this rather than But I don't know. Another interesting image, another, fact, another factoid about this image is that the figure is nude. Yes, but it implies that when the person died, he was nude. Okay. People who normally die in crucifixion aren't buried nude. They have some clothing on. Yeah. The fact that he was nude implies that he was under, per was under uh, public display this way. But wasn't his body given to uh, who was Joseph, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea? Who, who washed and put... Not necessarily. The, based on this, there was no time for that. He was immediately taken down, put in this cloth, and buried. It implies a quick burial because there was no normal wrapping. There was no covering them up. The only uh, gesture is that they covered, uh, you 